Now, beloved, it's the tragedy of history that before judgment and destruction, many people's hearts and ears turn away from every voice that speaks for God. It's been that way through history, through biblical history, and it will be no less so in the last days. And I do believe that we are living in those days today. Paul the Apostle warns in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that in the last days the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine anymore. Not endure. They, they, they simply do not want it. They will resist truth as it is spoken, as it is revealed in its full balance in the Scripture. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teaching, teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned to, and turn their ears away from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. They will turn from the word of God, and they will turn to stories about God. But stories not founded in truth. They will turn to voices that claim to speak for God, but are not speaking for God, do not know what God is thinking, don't have his heart for the people, and these will be fables, just stories. But there's no power in them, there's no truth in them. Proverbs 27, 12 says a prudent man or a smart man sees the evil and hides himself. Or that means he finds himself a place of refuge. But the simple pass on and are punished. Folks, we, if we are wise, we must acknowledge the days that we're living in. We must acknowledge that the very things that Jesus speaks about in this and other chapters that speak about the end times have in measure at least come upon us. In Luke 17, verses 26 to 30, he tells us that Jesus tells us that society, just prior to his return, will be largely unaware of the perilous hour in which they are living. Now, you are most likely aware of it, but that's because you're the church of Jesus Christ. You have the Spirit of God within you. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into truth. And the true heart of the true Christian is not afraid to hear the whole counsel of God. The true Christian is not just looking for peace as it is or prosperity in a difficult time. The true Christian is looking for what God is actually saying. What is actually going to happen in this time that we're living in? And how does my life fit in in a manner that can bring glory and honor to your name? But society at large is going to be unaware of an incredibly perilous hour. Oh, folks. If you don't know by now, and I don't know by now, the hour that we're living in, and how perilous this hour is, when you see things unfolding and spinning as it is out of control, the preaching of righteousness in verse 27, he talks about Noah. Now Noah built an ark. He was told by God to prepare this place of safety. The New Testament calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And This tells me in verse 27 that the preaching of of righteousness, which means entering into and living in right standing with God, will be largely ignored. The gospel that speaks of the cross, of taking up the will of God, of walking with God, of repenting, of turning from sin, of living a life that brings honor and glory to God, will be largely ignored. There will be preaching, yes, but it will not be this kind of preaching. And... Those who truly are standing and representing God will find their houses as it is passed by. Oh, we're living in a day when the people are gathering by the tens of thousands to hear popular messages of how you can become successful and famous and experience this great destiny, which is always a bigger slice of the economic pie and influence over the lives of other people. And those that are preaching repentance and turn, live for God, bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the four corners of the earth, are finding in our generation, many of them, their houses are being passed by. Noah is building, and the door is open into this place of safety. And the scripture calls him a preacher of righteousness. So he had to be, for all of the season he was building, warning the people of the days that were coming, warning them that there's only one place of safety. There's not others. It's it's not inconceivable that there were others in that generation talking about safety and talking about God, where God is found and how God works and how God's people enter into a place of safety but there was only one place of safety and yet that place was largely ignored in Noah's day and in verse 28 he says likewise as in the days of Lot they ate, they drank they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it, no, these things are not wrong folks, you have to eat You have to. we buy, we build 
there are things we do. It, it's not saying these things are wrong. What this, Jesus is telling us is that there is no awareness of the hour they're living in. They're just carrying on every day like there's a thousand tomorrows. When there, for them, at least in that time, there were very, very few tomorrows left. And Lot was a man who went into Sodom. He heard from God. And he went into Sodom and he tried to speak to his sons-in-law. And the scripture says they, they looked upon him as a man who was joking. He had heard directly from God. We've got to get out of here. We've got to distance ourselves from this place because there's a destruction coming here. But they looked at him and they received him as a man who'd come into their house to tell them a joke. There was no reverence of the word of God. There was, there was nothing of the warning of God. And those who have heard from God and are warning others, just as in the day of law, Jesus said, will be mocked. This is how it will be. Verse 30 says, this is how it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When I come back, this is how it's going to be. There's going to be a very real shortage of the preaching of righteousness. And there's going to be a mockery among the people in the society to that which truly speaks for God and represents God. Folks, we are in a moral tailspin. It's happening very, very quickly. Oh, beloved, if ever there was a time... When you and I need to be pressing into God, it's now. If ever there was a time, we need to be opening this book and not playing games with God, going in to see what it is that God is speaking to us. If ever there was a time where we should be pressing in to the prayer closet and shutting ourselves in to know what is in the mind of God and to know how we fit into the plan of God, it should be now and in our generation. Now, verses 20 to 24 seem to be telling us that before Christ's return, there's going to be a great deal of confusion about who God is, where God is, and what God is doing. The Pharisees came to him. Now, it's interesting. It's not the church. It's the Pharisees that are asking. And they're saying, because they expected a material and a political kingdom. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for peace and prosperity and power. That was what their focus was. So they came to Christ, and they said, now, when is this kingdom that you're speaking about coming. Jesus looks at them and says, this kingdom that I'm telling you about does not come by anything you can see with your natural eye. It's not a political kingdom, folks. It's not a kingdom that, uh, that people can look at. It's, it's, he said, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Beloved, that's how you know you're a child of God. The true children of God are not led by these voices. They found the true Christ who has already come. You see, Christ was already there. They were looking at the kingdom of God but could not discern it. The kingdom of God is not something material. The kingdom of God is a person. And this person's name is Jesus Christ. They could not discern him. He has already come. Yes, he's coming again, but he's already come. And he's already establishing his kingdom. His kingdom is well underway. His kingdom has been underway for over 2,000 years, folks. Hallelujah. It's already being established. He already has a people that he's been living in and walking in and establishing his throne. And his government has been active and alive. And he's been speaking in this kingdom. He's been on the throne. This kingdom is called the church of Jesus Christ. His kingdom has been on the earth for 2,000 years. For as the lightning, in verse 24, that lights out of one part under heaven, shines to the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Now, lightning gives light, and one day the whole world is going to know in a moment when Christ physically returns. The whole world is going to know. He's, uh, so if somebody tells you, hey, he's appeared in Egypt, don't believe it. Or he's over here in this place, don't believe it. He said, as lightning goes from one end of heaven to the other, when I come back, the whole world in a moment of time is going to know when I come back. But till then... He gives light. I see this in verse 24. He said, I am till then the one who gives light in darkened places. If you've ever been outside at midnight in a lightning storm and a flash of lightning goes across the sky, all of a sudden you can see where you're going. Darkness is dissipated by 
the appearance of this incredible and this powerful light. Oh, I thank God that no matter how dark it gets in this world, Jesus said, I am from one end of heaven to the other. I'm going to give light to those who are mine. They're going to know where they're going. They're going to know what their purpose is. They're not going to stumble in darkness. They're not going to be taken captive. They're not going to fall into some unaware trap. They're going to know. They're going to know. They're going to know. In Exodus 14, when God's people were coming out of captivity and their pursuers were coming after them, the scripture tells us that the Lord came down in the form of a pillar and he stood between the children of God and the enemies of the children of God. To the children of God, the scripture says he became light. He shone a pathway. They could travel by day. They could travel by night. They didn't have to slow their pace. They knew where they were going. He made a way through impossible places for them. But to their enemies, the scripture says he became darkness. He veiled, as it is, his own light from those who were following the children of God. But their whole motivation was to captivate them and bring them into captivity. But God says, no, this world is not going to captivate my church. I have a people that are called to glorify my name. And I'm going to lead them out and they're going to call me father. And I'm going to call them my sons and my daughters. And they're going to be my bride for all of eternity. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light unto my path. Hallelujah. I'm not concerned about this generation. I'm not concerned about the darkness. Oh yes, I'm concerned for the sake of people who need to know Christ as Savior. But I know the darkness cannot stop what God has begun in my heart. It cannot stop what God has begun in my home. Darkness has no power over me anymore. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. He says in verse 33, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life shall preserve it. You know, those who seek to preserve themselves through material familiarity are suddenly going to see all that they worked for and trusted in for their futures washed away before their eyes. There is a season coming, folks, when everything but Christ is going to be washed away. The writer of Hebrews says, Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That only that which cannot be shaken which is the life of Christ within you and within me, might remain. Oh, folks, calamity is coming. Difficult days are coming on the whole world. I would be a liar if I stood here and told you otherwise. Difficult days, hard days in the natural, are coming to the whole world. Not just the United States of America, but the whole world is going to know this. And many of you here today, you're already on the journey. You're already in the field. You're already out there telling people about the goodness of God. You're already considering going and obeying God. You're, you're a step ahead of those who are just on the roof of the house seeking the will of God. And Jesus says in that day, don't turn back. Don't turn back to what you left behind. Young people, listen to me. Don't turn back to what you left behind. What you left behind never satisfied you. What you left behind gave you a hunger that led you to Jesus Christ. Don't turn back. There's nothing there. Don't look for security in this world. You're not going to find it. Don't look to be entertained out of your difficult situation. It's not going to happen. Keep going with God. No matter how dark it gets, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Until every man, woman, and child that Christ has destined you to stand before has heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep going, folks. Keep going. Don't turn back. You may have to put this tape in your stockpile and pull it out sometime in the future. But I'm telling you, and I'm speaking to you in the Spirit, when things get difficult, don't turn back to where you came from. There is no security there. The whole world is going to be gathering around familiarity. People are going to be going back to where they have come from. People are going to gather around things of familiarity and that once brought them comfort, country, culture, all these things people are going to be gravitating to. But God says, not so for my people. Not so. This is not where your security is. This is not where your comfort is. If you're already in the field, keep going. No matter how dark it gets, keep going in the field. Proclaim the kingdom of God. I'll be with you even to the end of the world. I'll be with you.
Remember Lot's wife, he says in verse 32. Lot's wife just couldn't get far enough from a perishing society. She hesitated. She walked slower than she should have. She was sort of leaving, but couldn't quite make the break. And when this whole city exploded into the air, she became covered as it is with the residue of a failing and a falling society. And Lot's wife is, wife is the type of a people who take on the collective fear and confusion of a godless society in difficult times. Remember Lot's wife. God came, an angel visited, God himself came and took Lot by the hand and said, Get out, get your family and get out of this place. Let not your heart be here. Let not your security be here because nothing you see is going to remain and it will offer no comfort to anyone in the future. His wife could not make the break. And folks, for those who can't make the break, you're going to end up getting your security from talk radio in the days ahead. You're going to get it from magazines. You're going to get it from newscasters. You're going to end up getting it from other people. And it's the residue of a falling society will cover you. And you will end up fearless and confused. Just like Lot's wife did. The Apostle Paul, in speaking of the last days... He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now I do believe, beloved, we're in the beginnings of this. I don't know how deep we're into it. But I have lived to see a tremendous falling away in what professes to be the church of Jesus Christ. From the biblical Christ, from the Christ of truth, there has been a great, great falling away in our generation. Now listen, you can't fall off a building unless you've first been on it. You can't fall away from something unless you've been close to it. You have to at least have been in proximity. I'm not suggesting that everyone falls away was ever a Christian in the first place. But they got in close enough, just like the Pharisees were right there saying, tell us about the kingdom. When is the kingdom coming? They're right there. They're in proximity to Jesus. Probably just a matter of a few feet away from him. And in a similar way, there will be many who have pressed in, but they've not pressed into truth. They've not pressed into a living relationship with God. And they will decide the way that is before them is too difficult. It's not appealing to the flesh. And so they will walk away from him. Just as they physically did in the three years that he was here in bodily form ministering in this world. You go to Thessalonians and Paul says, Because they received not the love of the truth, God will send upon them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There are people who have manufactured a dead Christ in our generation. It's not the living Christ. It's another Christ. It's a Christ that they can gather to and they can gorge their bellies off of this Christ. They gather in assemblies, all never to give, never to go, never to yield, never to be abandoned, never to take up the cross. It's just to fill their bellies. This is a dead Christ. And he says, wherever the dead body is, there will the vultures. Those who gather. Remember the Apostle Paul says they're enemies at the cross. Their God is their belly. Their mind is on earthly things. He said, I tell you this even weeping. That many preach, but they're the enemies at the cross of Jesus Christ. Beloved, in this generation, we've got to have a cry in our hearts. And the cry has got to be, Jesus, give me the courage not to turn back to what I've left behind. Give me the courage. And it begins now, here in this sanctuary. Oh, mighty men and women of God just aren't born in a moment. Mighty men and women of God have made decisions along the way. I'm sure it might have been very favorable to stay in Saul's kingdom. That's where the supply was. That's where the favor of the king, as they saw it, was. But there were 400 in that particular time, that particular era, that says, no, it might be more advantageous and less risky for me to stay with Saul, but I'm going where the anointing of God is. I'm going where the truth of God is. I, we've seen the Spirit of God on David. And even if he's living in a cave and seems to be pursued like a partridge in the mountains, I'd rather be there with him. Folks, there's a time coming when you're going to have to make a decision to say, I'd rather be with Christ than to enjoy all the pleasures and, so, and seeming securities of this society all around me, than to have the favor of men. I'd rather have the favor of God than have the favor of the whole society that's dying around me. I'd rather live for God. And that's where mighty men and women of God are born. They make a decision. I'm not 
going to go back to what I left behind. Even if I have to live in a cave. Even if I have to suffer for a season. I'm staying with God. I'm going to walk with God. And folks, there's a season for those who make this decision that one day you step out of that place of seclusion and the Spirit of God is upon you. And you begin to preach like you've never preached before. You have authority. You have clear thinking. There's a power working within you. The kingdom of God has come to you. Christ has found somebody he can walk with. And his life begins to flow through your life. His hands begin to touch through your hands. His voice speaks through your voice. His eyes begin to see through your eyes. And you begin to understand, Oh God, your kingdom has come within me. God, thank you for giving me the courage not to go back to what I left behind. There's nothing, there's nothing there, there's nothing there, there's nothing there. There's trembling, there's fear, there's perishing, there's confusion. I'm not going back there. I'm walking with God. I'm going to walk with God all the days of my life until the end of this journey. We need to be able to cry, Jesus, give me the courage to seek you and not to be afraid to follow where you lead me. Give me the courage, oh God, to go into my prayer closet, the housetop as it is. And Lord, no matter what you show me, give me the courage to believe that you're well able to give me the power to do it. Even if I've never done it all of my life. Even if I don't think I have the strength to do it. God Almighty, even if it's not favorable to the people around me, I will go. I will obey you. I will do what you call me to do. Give me the courage to seek you and not turn back into my house and get my old stuff and begin to build my life on these things. Help me today. We should cry to make the break that I need to make from ungodliness. Help me, God, not to live too close to an ungodly society. Help me not to live a life of mixture because there's no power there. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You need a voice in this generation. You need a voice, oh God. That voice has to be your church. You need a voice. You need a voice or people will not hear. If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, how will the people prepare themselves for the battle? Oh God, help me to speak for you. Help me to stand for you. Help me to live for you. Help me to be found where you are. Help me not to limit you. You made my eyes and my hands and my heart and my body. You are well able to do, God, everything you say that you want to do through me. Give me the courage to obey you. Give me the courage not to turn back, oh God. David says this. Let me read it to you. Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, oh God. Be merciful to me. My soul trusts in thee. In the shadow of thy wings I'll make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. David had a choice to make and he made the right one. He said, God, I'm coming under your wing. I don't understand everything that's going on around me. But I do know that where you are, that's where strength is. That's where power is. That's where provision is. That's where hope in the future is. It's where you are. And I choose to be where you are. Even if it's in a cave in an unpopular time, that's where I'm going to be found. That's where I'm going to go. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performs all things for me. He says, God, I will cry out to you because you are well able to do everything that you say you'll do through my life. I will cry to you, O God. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. David said, My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above the earth. See, this is what marked David as a man different from those of his generation. He said, God, I am surrounded. I am surrounded by evil speakers. I am surrounded by those who are set on fire against you and your ways and your truth. And then he said, cries out, he said, but O God, be exalted. Let your glory come above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. Be exalted, O God. They've prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They've digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. But my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harp. I myself will awake early. 
I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing to thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great to the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. And then David concludes and says, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let thy glory be above all the earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, O God. Jesus, 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 Son of God, be everything in me that you want to be in me. Let your kingdom come and through this earthly vessel be glorified. Let the desires of your heart be made known. Let the desires of your heart be fulfilled. Let the kingdom of hell shake off of its foundations. Let men and women rise up out of obscurity and darkness and let them know you as King and Lord and Savior, Victor and Deliverer and Healer. Let them know you. Let them know you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, give me the courage not to turn back to what I've left behind. Some of you are turning back already. Don't go there. There's nothing there. You end up building a sandcastle. And when difficult times come, it'll be washed right out from under your feet. And you'll be left with nothing to stand on. Give me the courage to seek you, Jesus, and to follow you wherever you lead me. And help me to make the break from all ungodliness. You cannot spend your week entertained by stupidity and have an understanding of the things of God. You can't do it. You can't do it. You will become exactly what you look at and listen to. And so will I. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.